Well, good morning or good afternoon here from Dubai and good morning or evening from wherever you all are across the world. My name is Sam Champon. I'm the regional head of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply for the Middle East and North Africa region. And welcome to this, the sixth webinar in the SIPS MENA series. In today's session, we're going to go back to basics, back to the beginning. Let's forget about the complex models or strategies that people often associate with procurement or even the basic concepts that people assume procurement is all about. Today, we're going to focus on exactly what this function, this profession actually is all about. Now, we'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end, so please do use the Q&A button below uh, to ask questions as we go along. If you wish, just simply type your questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. If you want to ask me a question live, then use the raise hand button, which is at the bottom of the screen as well and I'll do my best to, to interact with you. What is procurement? What is procurement? That's a good question, because it's a moving target. It isn't uh, what it was just a few years ago, and it certainly isn't what it was um, a few decades ago, or even a decade ago. The function and the requirements of, of people who do procurement has changed significantly. And today, it's the strategic function that sits at the heart of the business. Or is it? Looking at the evolution of procurement from what it used to be to what it is now or what its capabilities are, um, it certainly is, but that sometimes depends on the organization you work for or the location geographically in which you're situated. The maturity of the profession, those within it, and its internal and external stakeholders differ widely. So much so that a question that's been asked certainly to me before is exactly this the question of can anyone do procurement can anyone do procurement what is this function and what's so special about it surely just anyone can do procurement and that's been said a few times and and let's face it it depends on what your specific perception or description of procurement is can anyone do procurement you've got a few people in this picture here who seem to have stumbled upon uh, a way in which to acquire certain goods they're in the right place they're most probably getting those goods for the right price they seem to be getting a good price here so from a representative perspective are they doing procurement and if they're doing procurement can anyone do procurement a commonly asked question. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to go back to basics. We're going to explore what procurement is from a perception uh, point of view and from a reality point of view. And we'll take some questions as we go along. So definitions. Let's go back to the definitions again. What is the definition of procurement? Because there are many. You see some organizations who have a strategic sourcing department some have a supply relationship management department and in some organizations a procurement team was set up to negotiate and that was their main focus in some organizations procurement have more of an audit and compliance function other tags uh, are assigned to procurement from category management supply chain purchasing even CIPS as an organization until a few years ago were known as the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply, not Procurement and Supply. So titles are just that. There are many titles that are attributed to the art and science of procurement and supply. But they are just that, they're just titles. Let's stick to the, the main focus here. And the main focus is that the definition of procurement is probably a little bit more straightforward. The act or actions involved in obtaining goods and or services for the lowest total cost of ownership. That's pretty much what procurement is. All procurement professionals or procurement department is trying to do is to ensure that an organization achieves the lowest TCO or total cost of ownership in every single thing they do. 
and that involves a combination of those bubbles around the screen at the moment. And more often than not, it involves more than one of those bubbles. No procurement department can act effectively if all they do is negotiate in the same way that no procurement department can operate effectively if their main focus is on the relationship they have between suppliers or on managing contracts. It's a holistic profession and it always has been. And the way it is now uh, makes it even more complex than it was before. So what's TCO? What is total cost of ownership? Again, very basic concept. Certainly not rocket science, but let's just think about it for a second here. And let's just kind of divorce our thoughts away from one perception here. Because we did say that procurement is the, is the act of obtaining goods and services for the lowest total cost of ownership, not for the lowest price. And obtaining goods and services for the lowest price is something that is not and shouldn't be within the vocabulary of when you're talking about procurement. It doesn't describe anything into what this function represents. Total cost of ownership is what we're looking for. Price is something very, very different. So if you look at what we have in front of us, you may well have a stakeholder, whoever that is, the head of your transport department or um, your CEO, um, who's your stakeholder in this case, who says, for our organization today, we need you to go out, Mr. Procurement, we need you to buy us for the company a cheap car. Now, let's forget about what the perceptions of a cheap car is or are from a procurement perspective it's very very simple the only thing that defines a cheap car is the specification that's it not the price so your stakeholder asking you to buy that cheap car in looking at the car on the left to the car on the right it becomes the responsibility of that procurement profession professional to investigate and ask those questions to find out what's the specification so it just so happens that the specification in this case is the organization wants to buy a car to transport 10 employees a day from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, and they need to be there within an hour. Suddenly, the cheap car on the left doesn't meet the specification and therefore is out of the equation. And in this example, the cheap car is the one on the right because it's the only one that can meet the specification. And a basic concept like that seems to escape the abilities of a lot of people many, many times. One of the most basic concepts of total cost of ownership is the specification. If your stakeholder asks you to put in place a cleaning facility or a cleaning contract for your warehouse, you can do two things. You can engage with the lovely little Mrs. Mop on the left-hand side there for 20 dirhams an hour or whatever the price is, or you can invest over a five year period to buy some equipment such as the scrubber dryer. And all that's going to determine which avenue you go in is the total cost of ownership and the specification. If you need a particular area to be cleaned within a one hour period, and that's the only window you have, despite the cost differential, Mrs. Mop may not be able to do that. And if, if you spread out the period of time that cleaning is going on, um, it may well disrupt your operations. And therefore, the differential in costs that you saved by employing an individual cleaner may have been eaten away by your reduction in production capacity, for example. So specification is key here. And that's what procurement professionals time and time again need to push back to their stakeholders and make sure that the specification is fully understood and that the outcome of, the, of, of any exercise, any procurement exercise, satisfies the specification. Or of course, you can challenge the specification. Now, if you really do wanna buy a cheap car, you may well go back to your stakeholder and say, does that car really need to get from Dubai to Abu Dhabi in one hour? Or can it, can it take three hours? And if it can, go back to the car on the left. Very, very simple. And it's those basic tenants of interrogating and questioning specifications that make procurement teams prove their value as value added to the business. You've got to challenge the specification because 
the remit of procurement is to obtain for the organization the lowest total cost of ownership. And there are many elements to total cost of ownership, not just the specification, not just the price as we've already said, but certainly not just the specification. There are several other concepts that are not rocket science, but also add to the exposure or the economic exposure that your organization are going to have. One of the most important parts of procurement and supply is risk management. The mitigation of risk is one of the most important things in procurement and supply. And if you look on the left hand side there where we have a picture of the unfortunate Grenfell Tower incident in London, that's a classic case of um, price or cost over risk. So in this case, um, a refit of a building happened using um, cladding, which was more economically beneficial to the project. Let's put it that way. So it saved the overall project money. But let's look at the risk aspect. Part of the total cost of ownership is managing risk. And if as a consequence of um, putting uh, economically beneficial cladding on a building has led to that building being burnt down, then the remit of total cost of ownership has not been met. And there are many elements to this. I recall reading a story about um, the fast food chain KFC um, in the UK not so long ago, a couple of years ago, um, changing their supplier, um, probably based on uh, economic reasons. Um, I believe I stand to be corrected, but they changed their supplier in any case. And within a few days of that change of supplier, they were unable to deliver chicken to the KFC stores around London. And they had to close uh, for, I think, three days, something along those lines. Now, if you think about it, any savings you've made in that change of supplier and the renegotiation of whatever commercial arrangement you had has certainly been obliterated by the fact that you were unable to serve your customers for three days. That's a loss in total cost of ownership. And therefore, that needed to be taken into account for many reasons, including risk. So risk is a very important part. Cost avoidance also comes into the value you can build into specifications. And the example on the right shows the Olympic Stadium in London. And as part of the, the, um, the specification or the initial discussions between the uh, procurement team and suppliers, um, they, were, they were able to identify um, a significant amount of savings in the, in the construction phase. And those savings were then put to enhance the design. So the exoskeleton you can see around the, 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 the stadium itself, that was possible from the savings that were made from the initial stage of procurement. So, you know, the, the, the budget for that particular stadium has gone further by using the re-engineering, redesign and specification in alliance with suppliers, primarily led by procurement. So there are many areas in which procurement can add significant value. And they're not all about uh, reducing the, 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 the price. They're not all about getting the lowest price. They're all about other elements such as risk management, value creation, cost avoidance, and taking care of the specification. That's where you're adding value to your organization on a long-term sustainable way rather than um, just in as far as the price point is concerned. And there are other areas as well. Because procurement or the effect of procurement or the influence of procurement uh, can be very, very wide ranging. Can be very, very wide ranging. The effect of procurement is sometimes overlooked. And if you look at this example, we're exploring something called the procurement effect. Now, the procurement effect is the effect procurement has or an effective procurement function has. Um, in their ability to control and manage third party costs. So if you just think about the fact that procurement on an ongoing basis um, by adding value is managing, reducing and safeguarding third party costs, then if we look at the effect on, on overall organizational strategy, it could look like this. So the scenario is you have an organization and if you look at the screen to the far left, you have an organization who are currently running on a revenue basis of uh, let's say $100 million. 
They're making a profit of $30 million, profit, EBIT, whatever you want to call it in this particular scenario, um, at a, on a very basic level. That's how the organization is running. And from a strategic perspective, they decide they want to increase their profit by 20 million a year. If their profit is currently 30 million, they want to increase it to 50 million. And they want to look at how they can do that strategically as an organization. Now let's assume this is a, a manufacturing organization. Maybe they manufacture perfumes, let's just say. So there's a couple of ways they can do this. Now, the obvious and I guess the traditional way would be they would increase production, advertising, marketing, the sales and marketing production influence, in other words. So they want to increase their profit from 30 million to 50 million. And uh, if you look at the um, example number one, they've done that. They now have a profit, a bottom line of 50 million. And they've done that by increasing their revenue by 50 million. So revenue from 100 million to 150 million. But they've also done that by having to increase costs. They've had to increase their costs from 40 to 60 million. They've had to increase their overheads from 30 to 40 million. So what have they actually done here? So they've increased their revenue, which means they've increased their sales. But to do that, they've maybe had to increase their advertising costs, more and more adverts, ad media campaigns. They've had to probably increase their staff to manufacture more products, increase their facilities management allocation, maybe increase warehousing to, to cater for a, large, uh, a larger number of stock. Um, and all those costs have led to an overall increase in, in the, the revenue that they make and has hit the bottom line. So, so they've actually got the effect that they wanted. They've increased uh, by 20 million. Albeit, what they've had to do is significantly ramp up production. They've also had to spend some more money on marketing. But overall, from the bottom line perspective, they've achieved the, their objective. Now, what you can do is if you look at number two, you can line that against the procurement or savings influence. Now, at the end of the day, the strategic requirement for the organization was to increase their profit uh, by 20 million to 50 million. In the example number two, they've done that. Their bottom line is 50 million. They've simply done that by, by not having to increase their revenue. They haven't increased their revenue at all. They haven't had to do that, status quo. But they have gone in there, looked at their existing costs, probably re-engineered re them, rationalized them with making sensible decisions um, on a strategic basis. Um, and they managed to reduce the, they, they actually managed to keep their costs pretty static. You know, they, they've made sure that costs don't increase. Um, but they've looked at their overheads, which could in, include anything, could include um, facilities management costs, third party um, um, consultancy costs, things along those lines that are considered not essential to the business. And just by doing that, um, they've managed to reduce the bottom line. Now, if we just look at overheads that we, we're not talking about the procurement effect, um, looking at your direct human capital, we're talking about looking at some of your overhead costs in terms of what is your marketing budget and what's your arrangement with your marketing supplier and is it optimal? What is your facilities management costs and the, the cost of running your warehouse? Are they optimal? Um, is there a change to technology? Things along those lines. And those are the costs we're talking about procurement impacting. And just by doing that, you get the same effect. That's the procurement effect. Now, in the real world, of course, you would probably do both. Uh, but it, it really stands to say that you should not ignore the influence that your procurement function can have over your business as well because that's what they're there to do. So overall, what does a professional procurement department or function do? It does a lot of things, but they fall directly into some main categories. It goes without saying that pr procurement is all about the right quality, right place, right, right quantity, right price. That goes without saying, um, that's basic. But actually, to achieve the total cost of ownership, what procurement teams are aspiring to do is to have the right balance of supplier relationship management, contract management, and category management. And also to have the requisite skills in at least all of these three areas because they're not mutually exclusive. 
So for a, for a professional procurement team or professional procurement function, they need to be highly skilled in supplier relationship management and category management and contract management, as well as all the other elements. Not and or, but not mutually exclusive. It needs to be well-rounded and have the skills in all those areas. So let's delve a little bit more deeply into these three areas. What are these things? So, so supplier relationship management. What exactly is supplier relationship management? It's mentioned sometimes, you know, I've seen in text, you see people talk about supplier relationship management, how to treat your suppliers, SRM. What is that? Well, it's another term that goes back quite a way, but what's the history of SRM? Very, very simple business concept. Before the 80s, late 70s, when US organizations were not doing so well in comparison to organizations in Japan. The usual exercise was, was undertaken where um, some of the big four firms, big four um, strategic consulting firms were tasked with finding out exactly why that is. Why are these Japanese companies doing so well? They did that research and the outcome was unexpected because they thought it was going to be something fundamental as to why US companies are not doing as well as their Japanese part counterparts. But it was discovered that the only difference between how the Japanese companies were operating, or certainly the overwhelming difference between how the Japanese companies were operating, was actually simpler than it seemed. It's, it seems that actually what happened at the time, the managers or the operators or the seniors in the Japanese countries, companies simply treated their suppliers as partners. Simple as that. And just by treating their suppliers as partners, that had a fundamental effect on how effective and how successful their businesses were. So that's how supplier relationship management was, was born. So obviously from these um, strategic uh, reviews that came back from these, the consultants, the aim was to say, look, to perform even better, you need to form strategic relationships with your suppliers. And that's how SRM was born, to have that effect on organizations. So that's what SRM is. It has quite a long-winded description, but essentially what SRM or supplier relationship management is supposed to be. It's supposed to be all about the, the actions related to forming a strategic and mutually beneficial relationship with your suppliers, which can elicit results over and above the type of results that you would achieve by having a normal, traditional, transactional arrangement. In other words, a contract. So if you're just gonna have a traditional relationship with the, with the supplier, you run a tender, sign a contract and get on with it, then you will get a certain uh, amount of results and success. But what SRM is designed to do is to say, by entering into a more strategic relationship with your suppliers, you're able to get a more strategic, effective, efficient relationship, and as a result, uh, better business outcomes. So that's what it's all about. Now, the ways to do that, obviously, are a wider subject, which we can go into in a different seminar, but essentially, that's what SRM is all about. Because there are other elements around su supplier, um, supplier management, uh, per se because all of us have functions where we go through registration and pre-qualification of suppliers. That's not SRM. That's an element of it. That's the transactional side. Yes, you register suppliers here, you pre-qualify suppliers. That's fine. That's standard. That's, that, that, that's a part of the overall SRM experience. At the end of it, you also performance manage suppliers. You make sure they're complying with contracts. Fine. That's part of the, uh, of the supply experience, but core to all of that, what sits in the middle of that is something called supplier relationship management where you actually um, you know, strategically intervene and make sure that you develop a strategic or on a basic level, a good relationship between yourself and suppliers um, for the benefit of two parties. So a partnership in effect. And as we know, every partnership like marriage, which is a partnership, relies on a good relationship between the two parties. Otherwise it's not a partnership. So supplier relationship management has the same fundamental concepts as that.
It, it relies on you as an organization having a good relationship between you and the suppliers. And it's proved that just by doing that, there are beneficial business outcomes. So, so how's that done? The, the first on a very basic level, what you have to do is just to put into context, we're talking here about your strategic suppliers. So we're not talking about every single supply you deal with, but you are talking about your strategic supply. So from an SRM perspective, the first thing you do is you decide who your strategic suppliers are and who are going to be subject to all the efforts um, in, in building those strategic relationships and in your SRM activity. So you use something like this, there's the standard four box matrix or the Kraliak matrix, and you would go through an exercise to, to decide or identify who your strategic partners are, who your strategic suppliers are. That could be quite a complex exercise, but they will fall into one of these boxes. You look at your leverage suppliers and who are they? Uh, they, they are, you know, org organizations who you deal with, who have a high impact on your profit, but there's a high availability of the items which they're providing. And it, de it depends on the organization you're with. So if you're, if you work for an IT company, for example, you may look at the company who supplies the casing for your computers, let's say the plastic casing. Now that's a, that's a high profit impact. Okay, it's, it's essential and it's a high profit impact on your organization because you do need those suppliers to provide you uh, with those casings for your laptops or to, to provide you with the raw materials. However, in this case, there are many suppliers who can do that. So they may not, for your organization, be a strategic supplier. They'll be a leverage supplier. So they are very important, but you wouldn't necessarily have to have that high level strategic close relationship with them just for the fact that there, there are other suppliers out there. And you may look at suppliers who are non-critical, who are non-critical suppliers. For most organizations, you know, your stationary and consumable suppliers are non-critical. You wouldn't necessarily have a strategic relationship with your, um, with your consumable suppliers unless you are that type of company, unless you're a printing company perhaps. Your supply of office stationary and consumables would be a non-critical supplier there's high availability uh, of those items and there's low risk perhaps. And then you look at your bottleneck suppliers and who are your bottleneck suppliers. Um, again, it depends if you are, if you're maybe a um, producer of perfumes, perhaps, then you may look at, um, you know, the, the supply of some of the commodities there, the natural flavors, the vitamins. Um, you may look at those as bottleneck suppliers. And what do we mean by those? Is it, Critical items, yes. However, the prices fluctuate. There are several suppliers out there. Uh, you will change suppliers on, on a regular basis based on availability, based on di different pricing levels. So you wouldn't necessarily build a very strong relationship with the supplier, but you would want to make sure you have relationships with several suppliers so you can ensure continuity of supply. So you'll call them a bottleneck supplier. But those strategic ones are the ones who, you, who we would put you know, top right hand corner, and those are the ones to which you would, you would aim to be building a strategic relationship. And if you're Tesla, for example, if you're the car manufacturer Tesla, then the supplier who provides you with batteries, the electric batteries, the lithium batteries, would probably be one of your strategic suppliers. You'd want to have a very, very strong relationship. You want to keep very close to those guys. You want to make sure that they're available. Um, the supply is going to be maintained because that is critical to what you do and you can't afford for any hiccups because that will have a high profit impact. Uh, there are not many suppliers out there. You can't switch overnight. They are key to what you're doing because you're, you're building electric cars. So they, they, they hold in the key components and those are the relationship, those are the suppliers who you'd have a strategic relationship with a win-win relationship. So that puts into context, but there is a, there is a separate side to this. And, and that's of course the buyer perspective. What you have in front of you is the seller perspective. And while I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, you always have to remember that there is a seller perspective and suppliers also would most likely do the same exercise of you as you've just done. And they would want to put you in certain boxes. They would put you into the top left-hand corner. They'll, they'll want to decide, that you as a client, what are you? Are you aligned with their brand values? In which case, um, great, yes, 
they do want to work with you. You're very attractive, but you're not core to what they do. Okay, so they, they do want to work with you, your, your, your account they want to develop, and perhaps they will be open to you talking about or negotiating with them over value-add activities, perhaps. But if you go down the bottom left, if you're a nuisance supplier, if, you, if you're actually adding no value-add to their organization, there's no brand association, um, you wouldn't necessarily know that, but if you are a nuisance um, client to them, then one of the outcomes of that would be I mean, you certainly couldn't negotiate hard with, hard with suppliers like that because they don't have an issue with losing you as a client. Um, so again, it all depends how the suppliers have segmented you in the same way as you segmented them. Are you exploitable? There are suppliers who, uh, who have goods or services that, uh, that they would place you as a client in the exploitable box. They know that they can, they can get a lot of value from you. They can get higher profit margins from you because what they have um, is valuable to you. And they know that they have the, the upper hand over you. So for example, again, it'll be very difficult for you to drive a hard bargain with suppliers like that, especially if they put you in that exploitable um, area. So it's only those suppliers who see you as a client, as core, who you're gonna be able to, um, organize a strategic relationship with in any case and if you are as i say if you're tesla then you want to make sure that you're able to um to work that you're able to align with your uh supply of lithium batteries and you're able to agree and you're able to to position yourself so that you in fact are core to them in the same way as they're strategic to you so know your suppliers and importantly you need to know your suppliers as well as they know you because suppliers do know you as an organization. And sometimes, you know, as a, as a procurement professional, you can get carried away. You can look at, you can forget that suppliers do have a lot more power than we think they have. And they're not gonna tell you everything. Suppliers know the cost of what they're producing. Now, what we have in front of you gives you an obvious choice and, and says a supplier is saying to you that you can, you can only pick two of these. Okay, so these are the outcomes you're gonna get. But they're not gonna say that to you. If you're saying you want something that's good, cheap and fast, they may say, fine, we can give that to you. And they may omit to say, but it's not gonna be delivered on time. So remember, you just have to know your suppliers as well as they know you. And that's the core of supply relationship management. The important thing is that you've got a win-win scenario between, the between you and your strategic suppliers so that it, is, it really is a win-win scenario. That's the only way SRM works. And as I've said, it's been proved that that was the fundamental difference between the companies in Japan and the ones in the US at the time. So moving on, uh, actually, sorry, without moving on from supply relationship management, the final, a final um, example of supply relationship management in action is this, is the example of Apple. Now, Apple invests only three and a half percent of its revenue in research and development. Now, Apple has significant revenues, as we know, and it invests 3.5% of that in R&D. And other organizations on different verticals in which Apple works, as it says here, spend, spend significantly more on research and development than Apple do. That's supplier relationship management in action. Because what it says is that Apple, as an example, may be on the verge of designing the new iPhone 12 or whatever we're on to now, and it's likely that what they'll do is go to a strategic supplier of theirs and say, we are going to produce the new iPhone in six months time. Can you go out there and develop the new battery for the iPhone? And that's your task. In six months time, their strategic supplier will come back to them with the battery. They would have done the research and development around um, designing that battery and Apple would have developed the phone as an example. And it's a win-win scenario because the supplier knows that Apple will buy the stock of the battery they bought to satisfy their own demand. And uh, Apple will get what they want because they, they have not expended the same time and money of research and development uh, in developing that particular, that particular component. So just by doing that, 
just by exercising supply relationship management to its different aspects, um, what you can see is the differential between Apple saving what between 10 and almost 20% of their, of their revenue, which is not insignificant, uh, by applying SRM, supplier relationship management concepts. So that just shows how important it can be because the reality is that by using traditional procurement concepts, by floating a tender, um, for example, nobody is going to save 10% or 20% of, of Apple's revenue, that kind of money, just by, just by floating a tender and selecting the lowest bidder. It's not going to happen. So that's the benefits of SRM in action in, in alignment with, all, with other procurement concepts as well. So supply relationship management, the other one we mentioned was category management. Now what is, what is category management? Category management in effect is the, the methods of taking a, a, a helicopter view of the spend and activities of an organization in a, in a very holistic way. So all category management means is that if you're working in, in, a, in a large organization or a small organization, you have a full handle of all the categories of spend in which you engage in. And let's go on a basic per perception different departments in your organization by pens. It doesn't make sense that different departments by different specifications uh, from different suppliers of different pens of different costs and different delivery times with different logistical methods um, within the same organization on the same category of spend. And your category management strategy will either prove that it's necessary to do that or it's not. And your category management strategy will put together a strategy that maximizes the value of buying that pen at its very basic form but you can go further than that and certainly a re review of um, the um, procurement spend uh, some time ago the UK government looked at for example the spend on IT and they um, discovered that the, the the spend on IT with one particular supplier was spread disparately across loads of different departments so this supplier had different contracts with different government departments at different prices, different terms for the same components. Um, but there is actually one single buyer. There's one single budget holder in this case, and there was the UK government. A category management structure would have looked at all of that and gone back to the supplier and said, um, look, why, are we, why have we got contracts for you to provide 10 laptops to these guys here, 20 to these guys here, and 100 to these guys there? Actually, the full amount it's 2,000 laptops. Okay, so let's now talk about the volume for that. Let's talk about the distribution for that. Let's talk about the logistics for that. Uh, let, let, let's be realistic. So your category management strategy would, would use data to, to collect exactly what you're spending on a particular item and then formulate that into, into a coherent strategy. Contract management. What's contract management? Contract management, again, seems very basic, but essentially a lot of people will enter into a contract and once the um, once the services start that contract will be put in a drawer and out the way which is the correct thing to do okay because you don't run supplier relationships by you know going to the contract every day and seeing what needs to be done but the key thing is before entering into that contract it should be exactly clear and everyone should understand what the requirements are so are you going to have key performance indicators are you going to have service level agreements are you going to have a cleaning contract that says we want you to provide us with 10 cleaners or are you going to have a cleaning contract that says we want our building to be clean because those are two very very different things the supplier can provide you with 10 cleaners but how are you going to hold them to account how are you going to define what your perception of clean is so it's important that all those things are put in there what the incentives are around the agreement and and what governs the agreement and especially now in the COVID-19 scenario, the number of people have said to me, um, we're in a pandemic. Surely um, that is force majeure. Well, is it force majeure? What does your contract say? Force majeure is not, is not just an English language term. It's a clause in a contract. Have you designed it? What jurisdiction are you in? Are you a civil law jurisdiction? Are you, in a, are, 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 you, are you following different uh, forms of law? What part of the world are you in? So those are all the considerations. It, you know, it's not just a case of, is something force majeure? 
you've got to look at your contractual relationship and you should really the idea is to have have tried to assimilate what those outcomes are going to be before entering into a contract so you need to look at all outcomes before you enter into a contract because that's going to govern your relationship when things go wrong so that's what contract management is it's an important tool for procurement managers and everyone else to make sure that you're not just rubber stamping a contract and you're not just taking a pdf form of um key terms and conditions and entering into a contract without understanding exactly what the implications are when things go wrong another tool for procurement other areas of course not just supplier relationship management not just contract management or category management ethics is a key consideration for procurement as well because ethics is quite a complex area which people think only revolves around uh, people acting in an unethical way or taking bribes or something along those lines it is actually a very very key tool of knowledge for a procurement professional why well first of all because we know from looking at ethical behavior that 80 percent of ethical issues in a contract happen at the specification stage so this perception of people taking bribes and and you know awarding contracts at the, at, at the end of it or or manipulating contract evaluations is almost like the thin end of the wedge that's not the whole problem most ethical issues happen at the specification stage so for everyone involved in procurement and supply chain decisions they need to understand what constitutes ethical behavior uh, so that you can actually guard yourself against that and ethics is a big subject because as you can see from here it's adding something like 10 to 20 percent to the cost of doing business so prices costs of goods and services are inflated to that effect depending on where you are in the world simply because of ethical issues so ethics is a key part of procurement supply and it's something that procurement professionals need to understand and need to be fully versed in to be effective procurement and supply professionals so just just coming full circle on this what does that mean we spoke about a lot of things um, over the course um, and we've covered a lot of ground but essentially from where we started to what we thought procurement was it actually involves a lot of things total cost of ownership value creation risk management we mentioned those project management contracts ethics stakeholder management category management and many many things so procurement is a lot of things and negotiation so because it's a lot of things it means that the people who work in procurement or the departments that are representing you in procurement also need to be fully versed in all of these areas otherwise it's not procurement so these are the these are the key areas that your procurement professionals or your procurement departments need to be fully rounded and fully versed in and at that point you're delivering procurement value when you have those skills and you're able to take all of these in, things into account to make sure that your organization is getting total cost of ownership or value for money so going back if we go full circle can anyone do procurement can anyone do procurement well yeah of course anyone can anyone can do procurement in the same way that anyone can do any other function anyone could do procurement in the same way that perhaps i could go to an organization and be a legal director based on the presumption that i have an acknowledgement and knowledge of certain areas of law but that doesn't make me a legal professional does it in the same way that it goes for any function that doesn't make me a car mechanic and if i had an expensive car if I had a friend who had a knowledge of cars, I may get them to look at the car if something went wrong, but on the annual service, I'd have to take it to a professional. There's no difference in procurement. Procurement needs to be done by procurement professionals who understand all of the concepts that, that I mentioned before, because that's what will get you the professional outcome. So using that definition, well, well yes not anyone can do procurement so procurement managers like anybody else need to be professionals in what they do and probably even more so because this function involves the actions of not spending your own money but spending other people's money so the key here is i think what you have is you have a trend in the evolution of procurement by 
many organizations, stakeholders, non-governmental organizations, governments around the world who are getting to the concept of the licensed procurement team, which means that, yes, um, we, we will ensure that anyone who's spending our or other people's money is fully qualified and skilled to do so. So you have the UNDP, the United Nations um, Department, for example, they already have the ethos of anybody who works um, in that team, the biggest procurement team in the world, um, has to be qualified to do so, has to be SIPs qualified. And there's a number of organizations um, across this region who have the same concept and the same appetite to work towards ensuring that their teams are, their procurement teams are fully qualified to do procurement and fully skilled to do procurement. And these are some of, just some of the organizations um, in this region, in the Middle East, North Africa region, who have also given a full commitment to that ethos as well. That pretty much covers most of the things I was gonna, I was gonna go through. Thanks very much for listening. I'm gonna go to, there, there are some pings, some, um, some questions that I've seen. So I'm now going to have a look at some of these questions and I'll see if I can address them for you. So thanks very much for listening. So let's, uh, the first question, let's have a look at these questions here. So the first question I have is, um, many organizations are given importance to procurement, ignoring the rest of the chain. Is there any reasons why the rest of the chains are lagging behind the limelight as procurement? Uh, I can't really um, articulate that question too much except to say that well as far as I'm concerned when you're talking about supply chain uh, or procurement they're all tags really um, they're all part of the procurement cycle um, and you can't leave any part of it behind why are some people not paying more attention to supply chain why are some people not paying more elements to logistics um, it depends on the industry it depends on the company but you, you can't ignore one out of the other. If you, ha if you don't have a very good uh, logistics framework or, or you don't have a very good supply chain network or you, you're not practicing supplier relationship management or you're just deficient on one of those areas, then you're not obtaining to uh, good total cost of ownership for your organization. So um, you're not doing procurement to the optimal level, uh, I would argue. Um, another question says risk and value creation do have set parameters. Savings can still be achieved, although quality and standards are met while maintaining the design quality, time and cost. Yeah, I tend to, to agree with that. Uh, you're absolutely right. You, you do need to have parameters for, for, everything, for everything you do. Um, next question. Um, we have a huge role to play, but procurement doesn't have this much of influence in most cases. If business gets budgets from finance, they'll want to spend that. This has been my experience so far. So I'd agree with that um, uh, to a shipper who asked the question. Uh, fully agree in some cases. Uh, yes, procurement does have a role to play, but has, um, a, I'd say, a, a lack of influence in certain cases. Uh, so th the key thing is this. Some people believe that the technical skills around procurement are the overriding, uh, have overriding importance. Uh, and I tend to disagree to a certain extent, and I would say that the the soft skills in procurement have the have an overriding importance. In other words, influencing skills and stakeholder management skills are soft skills. If you are a senior procurement practitioner, you need to have an abundance of those skills. You need to have an abundance of influencing skills. You need to have an abundance of stakeholder management skills. Otherwise, you cannot improve, improve the influence of procurement in your organization. And therefore, all of your technical skills um, will almost uh, be, be, be going to waste because you won't be able to, to add the value you need to because you're unable to influence your stakeholders. So um, yes, you're right. The influence of procurement in some organizations may, be, may not be what it should be, uh, but you can work to increase that through using, um, through using your own influence. Uh, right. Uh, another question from Kingsley. What's the link between logistics, procurement and supply chain? Uh, good question. Now, what you can do is you can, uh, you can at any time go to the SIPS website, www.cips.org and look at our knowledge section. And there's something called 
the procurement cycle. Um, and, and really what you'll notice is that the procurement cycle covers everything from the, the, the purchase to the, to the logistics, to the interaction with the supply chain. Um, and what I'm trying to articulate here is that um, the link between logistics, procurement and supply chain is that they're all part of procurement overall because they all contribute to total cost of ownership. Your cost of obtaining a good from goods and services from somewhere else, from another region or, or, or within the same country, um, all has an impact on your total cost of ownership. So, that you, so you can't take that out of the equation. So the logistics, supply chain, they're all part of the overall procurement cycle. Um, what's the next question? Uh, can you give us some insights into areas of procurement pro uh, professionals must focus on in the current situation? Very good question. Uh, that's from, from, from R R Ramesh. There's two ways of looking at this, uh, Ramesh. There really are two, two areas. So are there specific areas of, of procurement that are relevant to the COVID-19 pandemic? If you went into that era, then yeah, you, you would say, look, um, let's forget about, you know, negotiation, advanced negotiation at this stage because the horse has already bolted. But certainly supplier relationship management is a very key skill um, to have uh, in this current scenario, you know, to, to be applying SRM to its highest degree, to, to, to making sure you maintain, uh, keep those strategic relationships between you and your key suppliers, the ones you're going to rely on. Um, that, that's very, very key. Uh, so to have an advanced knowledge of supplier relationship management. Having said that, there is a caveat to that you need to have already been um, implementing an element of SRM before COVID-19 happened. If you, if you did not have in place strategic relationships with your suppliers before, before um, the pandemic happened, you will struggle uh, to, to build those relationships up in this period of time. But those who have good strategic relationships with their suppliers pre-COVID, and, then, and maintain them during COVID will have the best outcomes when they're coming out of the scenario and they will be the, the, the organizations who perform the best because like any economic situation or any, any, any recession, it's not going to last forever. So you've got to think about what your relationship is going to be with your suppliers when you come out of that situation. Uh, one question from Kingsley, how can a Nigerian get certified? Um, uh, you can, you can, SIPS, SIPS is available in 150 countries in the world. Uh, we do have operations in Nigeria, certainly uh, send me a message. Um, you, you can send me a message um, on SIPS.org on LinkedIn or uh, sam.thechampong at cips.org and I can, I can direct you to uh, our, represent, our representatives in Nigeria. Uh, certainly our website has it cips.org but if you wish to contact me i can point you in that direction of, of how to get certified uh, in nigeria we certainly do have uh quite vibrant uh operations and events and thought leadership uh community in nigeria so so please do reach out uh another question can an individual be successful in in being a procurement specialist um uh, i don't quite understand that question fully um, in being a procurement specialist. Um, so perhaps if, if you're saying, can you be a specialist as opposed to a generalist, um, if that's what the question is, um, then the answer is yes, you can either be a specialist or generalist and both of them make sense. And uh, so Kingsley, if you want to ask that, if you want to ask that question live, um, I will allow you to do that. Uh, so just just unmute your mic, mic your microphone and you can ask that question live if I haven't if I haven't quite articulated that properly so just let me know and I'll come back to you go for it Kingsley uh, thank you very much um, you, need, you need to speak a bit a little bit louder Kingsley we can't hear yes you. okay can you hear me now please yes oh, okay this is um, Kingsley Mecha from Nigeria I'm actually a logistician right now but I've not been certified. So that's why I asked that question about um, certification. And um, I raised my hand initially before you answered that question. So you've given you clarity to read and I've sent you an invite on LinkedIn to, 
for me to as well get uh, more directions and um, try to point me to the right directions too. Thank you very much. You've been helpful. Fantastic. Thanks, Kingsley. I'm yeah. glad the question was asked, was answered. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a good day. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that clarifies that for Kingsley. As I said, if anyone wants to ask a question live, just, just click the raise hand button. We have another question uh, from Subash. Uh, During the current situation, the risk of obtaining goods and services are challenging. Our businesses are highly affected where 75% of suppliers agreed on reducing the cost or offering some discounts. What would you suggest for upcoming months as this does not seem to be getting resolved soon? Uh, that's a bit of a general um, question because it depends what area you're in. So it depends on whether you're in the food supply or supply professional services. Uh, it, it depends where you are. But the reality here is that um, it's a global pandemic. So, uh, you know, in some ways you could argue that some people were more um, exposed to the situation in China, for example, or exposed to the situation in certain parts of the world, uh, in which case um, you, you may need, you, some of the advice may be around trying to diversify your supply chain, but that's not the case. It's a global situation at the moment. And um, it's all about working with the supplies you have, seeking out new supplies as supply chains change, um, and, uh, and always looking to mitigate risk even while this pandemic is going on. That, that's, that's the key thing. So I think what I said previously was maintaining those strategic relationships with your existing suppliers. That's important because certain suppliers, depending on what they're doing, <clears throat> have an awful lot of leverage now. So what you don't want to do is to, is to lose a supplier who is key to you uh, for, for, for any reason, unless it's absolutely necessary. So uh, supplier relationship management, maintain those strategic relationships with your suppliers um, and also seek out from a risk perspective, alternative, alternative supply and alternative suppliers dur dur as the situation endures. Um, another question from um, Rajiv. So um, how do you strike a balance with a strategic partner based on the buyer's and supplier's perspective? What if the supplier is inclined to be dominating in the relationship and to his benefit due to monopolistic nature of the products and services? Uh, of course, that's a great question. And that's going to go back to your, uh, your Kraliak matrix, your supply matrix. Uh, you, you, you just need to you just need to make sure that this supply is actually a strategic supply to you and that you are core to them now um, if you're able to manipulate the relationship into that perspective then then that's good but if you're unable to and if the supplier actually sees you as a as a nuisance or a, or, or, or or if they um, if they regard you as anything other than a core client to them then you may have to start looking at different suppliers to, to, to manage the risk of loss of supply or, or, or increase in prices. So, so it's all about that initial supply segmentation as to, as to what your supply relationship strategy is. Um, next question, what are the key indicators that evaluate the situation in the purchasing department and what are the achievements that any purchasing or sourcing manager could accomplish to be successful in this job? A great question. So key indicators are you, you need to have indicators that show the value that you're, um, that you're uh, bringing into the organization. Now, a lot of people translate that as um, demonstrating your savings, which is fine. If, you, if, if your organization wants you to demonstrate uh, what savings you've made as an organization, as a, as a, as a department, then that's fine. Um, the important thing is you need to just make sure that the, the definition of what a saving is, is clearly um, agreed by all parties. Um, so, so that you're able to, to point out what those savings are. But in other ways, you, you could point out you know, what value you're bringing to the organization because different stakeholders may have different requirements. You may have a marketing team that is looking to have an extraordinarily quick um, speed to market from their procurement team. Maybe they want contracts to be put in place um, in times uh, quicker than the procurement team was previously doing. Uh, so if that's what the marketing department, for example, if that's what their KPI is, then maybe you need to be um, able to demonstrate to them 
that uh, that you're able to improve uh, cycle time, speed to market, things along those lines. Um, question, has SIPs, has SIPs got any plans to come to India off, offering certifications? Uh, we, we certainly uh, do some things um, around the region. The, the, answer I'll say, the answer I'll say to that at the moment is it, you can take SIPs uh, remotely anywhere. You, 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 can, you can do it online, but yes, currently we don't have um, an awful lot of uh, physical study centers in India, but certainly uh, if you reach out to me, I can guide you in, in the right way to, um, to allow you to embark on your study if you need to. And uh, we have uh, Aman. Did you want to ask a question? Aman, uh, uh, Amanullah, I'll come back to you in a second. Go for it. Uh, you need to speak a little bit louder. We have, uh, I want to ask a question regarding a department where we work for Jason is a part of a department. And there's a various departments in, in, a, in an organization um, which are, are looking for services from suppliers. And these various departments has department heads who like to push their suppliers to the purchasing department. And uh, you know, there are various reasons for it, like uh, which I, I will tell you, like, you know, there is some relationship which they made with suppliers which they want to keep it which can be over the table or under the table. In that case, how a purchasing manager will act? So, okay, so this is a good question. I'm just gonna, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Aman. I'm just going to, to meet you again. So, um, great question. I think what uh, Aman is saying is that um, in certain cases you have stakeholders who want to uh, maintain control over essential parts of the, of the uh, procurement process. In some case, we're talking about the control over supply relationships, sometimes over the negotiation part. Um, and, and that's true and that's unfortunate because what, where that happens in organizations where that happens, uh, and I'll be interested to hear from people if, that's, if that sounds familiar, but in organizations where that happens, it leaves the procurement team to be a very transactional procurement team because actually, everything's been done as far as the the procurement process and it just it just leaves it to you to transact to issue a purchase order sign a contract issue issue a tender things along those lines which to be honest is um is is not the most effective use of procurement resource so so what's the answer how do you how, how do you improve that and 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 what i will say is that again in this day and age, in the year 2020, in which we are, if you look at the evolution of procurement, um, aside from the technical skills, the, import, the most important skills um, that procurement professionals should have at all levels, uh, especially at the senior level, are those soft skills, are those influencing skills and stakeholder management skills. And you need to be able to influence within your organization to gain the trust and respect of your stakeholders so that they trust that you can uh, get better results from a procurement process and they can trust you to do that than, than they could do themselves. And that's when you get the ultimate trust uh, uh, from, from your organization and you're then able to start adding ultimate value. It's not an easy process, but it does take a lot of soft skills uh, to do that over a period of time. Um, now, and you'll find organizations uh, of different types uh, where some organizations procurement is mandated. So if you want to procure something, if you want to buy something, it has to go through the procurement team, okay? And then you have some organizations where procurement is not mandated. So uh, you have a procurement team and if you want to, you can engage them. I prefer the latter, I prefer the the scenarios where you have a procurement team in an organization and if you choose to use them you will and the reason i prefer that is because in those scenarios the stakeholders actually see the value in procurement and voluntarily go to them because they know that they could get better outcomes now again it takes time to build up that kind of um, reputation and trust amongst various stakeholders uh, and credibility uh, but at, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. You can have strong technical skills, but if no one's entrusting you to do things, uh, then, then you're not able to add value to an organization. Now, 
that doesn't talk about your second point, which is around uh, the ethical perspective of it. Uh, I think I think in your own words, what you said was, um, uh, you know, money under the table, I think was your um, exact description. Um, that's a whole different perspective altogether. That goes into the ethical perspective of procurement. Um, and I just got off a call earlier on today where I was congratulating an organization who had just received the SIPS ethical kite mark. So we have uh, what we call the SIPS ethics test where an organization or, or an individual rather um, goes through a process and takes an ethics test and does that every single year. Um, and if you, if you pass the test, then, then, then you, you, you get an ethics certificate and you're ethics certificated. And for organizations where their entire procurement team um, have gone through this process, or in some cases where the entire organization has done the SIPS ethics test, um, they have an organizational ethics certificate. And they're also on a public ethics register, uh, which, is, uh, which is available for anyone to view. So you'll see organizations, including Facebook, for example, Facebook are on the SIPS ethics register because all of their procurement staff have, have taken the SIPS ethics test and have passed it. So that's a whole different consideration. So again, it's, it's influencing the rest of the organization uh, to have a commitment to ethics. Um, and, and then that makes your, your job a, a little bit easier. Um, there was a question uh, from someone who says, how long does it take to become a certified procurement professional? Well, um, Look, if, if, if you look at the, the SIPs route, that, then, then there, are, there, there are several levels. There's, you go from the certificate all the way to the, to the professional diploma, and that's five levels, level two, three, four, five, six. Um, how long it takes you to get there is entirely up to you. Um, that, that there are different ways to go there. Uh, that there's about four different options in terms of how quickly you want to do it. Uh, but I will caveat that by saying that there, there's no shortcut um, to, to get there. Uh, you, you do need to get the learning and we can certainly guide you through that either through uh, through through various methods so just, so just just get in touch uh, and we'll be happy to guide you wherever you are in the world um, as I said there you, you can you can uh, you can do SIPs, SIPs study in over 150 countries in the world uh, but we also have regional um, regional centers um, the, the, the Middle East one is based in Dubai but we also have an Australasia one in Melbourne the UK one, South Africa, uh, uh, West Africa in Ghana, Chicago in North, North America. Uh, so so we, we do have, uh, and Turkey as well. So we, we do have regional centers where you can reach out um, either yourself or through your organization and we can see how we can assist you. Um, next question, can I talk about the procurement cycle? Um, yeah, I think um, that the procurement cycle uh, from a holistic basis uh, talks about the different elements of, of procurement and procurement, of course, is obtaining goods and services for the lowest to total cost of ownership. So, uh, so what does that mean? The cycle means that um, you start off with the identification of that demand. So someone, either an organization, someone in your organization says they want to procure something, well, the first thing they need to do is articulate that demand. What exactly do you want? Uh, what's, the be what's the benefit to the organization? Um, is it required? Specification? How many do you need? So that's the first part of it. And once, once you do that, you you'll you would then go to the next part of the cycle where you're agreeing exactly what the specification is. So you are, you, the, 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 the requirement is we need to, um, engage a cleaning company to um, to clean a hotel. Uh, so you have a certain specification. Uh, do you have the same specification of cleanliness at the front of the building or, uh, and at the back? Well, that's where procurement may come in and, and challenge that and say, well, actually, look, you, you could rationalize that that requirement by, by, by focusing the, the, the quality work in the visible areas, as an example. So once you've got the specification, then you need to identify the suppliers who's best place to do this, um, who, who are the people who can actually satisfy this demand. Then you enter the marketplace, select a supplier, evaluate that, that supplier's uh, bid based on uh, not just what they're saying, uh, not just the price they're going to um, uh, supply this goods or services to you for, but also 
based on the specification and the methods to which they confirm they can do this on, they, they, they can do this with, um, aligned with a bit of due diligence from yourself as to the capability of doing this as well. Um, how they're going to supply the service to you, where, where they're based, what's the logistics, are there any additional costs? Um, are there any other complications or considerations from a legal perspective? Uh, and, and how, and once they get that, those goods to you, um, how does the contractual relationship continue? So, you know, you may have goods, are they gonna sit in a warehouse? Are they gonna be supplied to you in a just-in-time basis? Are you going to have um, a cleaning or security provider? Um, are they going to provide you with people or are they going to provide you with the service? In other words, do they take the risk in, in how many security guards they provide you? So if the security threat level goes up, um, is it within their contract to, to fill that um, additional risk? Or uh, do you take that risk because it's an input specification and you have, you, you have told them um, the, the level of personnel they need rather than what the specification is. So that, those are the, the kind of elements you need to think about um, when you're looking at the procurement cycle. Uh, what else do we have? Um, when we work in a volatile demand pattern and supply ends up withholding huge stock due to a drop in demand, is exploiting suppliers, um, is exploiting suppliers and not taking responsibility for stock, stock um, is it ethical sourcing? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that, um, but I think what you're saying is the supplier is holding huge stock due to a drop in your demand. Um, are you exploiting the supply if you're not, if you're not uh, taking responsibility for this stock? Uh, well, well, I guess yes or no, I'd need to know the scenario, but, but again, th this is where contract management comes into it. You, you'd really... It, there's two things you'll need to be clear in what your contractual relationship is and what your obligations are to the supplier um, in terms of stock have you given a um, you know an indication of what the elements are that that generate your demand are you using historic volumes or is this covered in a contract so you you always need to fulfill your obligations in a contract unless uh, you've got you've got a negotiated outcome which which allows you not to fulfill your obligations so i i would really frown on people walking away from the obligations and saying uh we're in a pandemic so we're, we're not going to pay you or we're in a pandemic so we're not going to buy this off you even though it's clear that that service um is an ongoing service and it's within the contract if you're able to negotiate a reduction in service from your supplier and i do mean negotiate from on a two-way basis then then that makes sense uh, but to walk away from obligations, um, if that's what you're saying, is it, not really ethical. Uh, and just remember that the, the pandemic will end and uh, you, it's probably better to maintain a good relationship with suppliers rather, rather than a bad one. Um, so uh, we had another question here from... Uh, no, that's key indicators. Let me just have a look. Um, someone saying I'm looking to obtain MSIPs after completing a master's degree. Uh, should I still go through level four, five, six? Okay, so that, that's a bit of a technical question um, in terms of the qualification, but um, certainly you can reach out to me directly. Uh, the general answer is that, uh, yeah, if, if you have got a master's degree uh, in procurement or supply chain management, uh, then, then there are several uh, number of exemptions that mean that you don't need to go through the full SIPs curriculum uh, to, to obtain MSIPs. Um, question here, is there any preferable approach to follow within this duration, uh, i.e. The, the pandemic, to handle the difficult business units and stakeholders who, are, who don't understand the impact of COVID-19 on supply chain and want to fulfill the, the requirements with the, with the same level of service? Um, I would say yes, I, th I think the uh, preferable approach is to, um, it, it's, it's all about communication, it's all about um, articulations and, and stakeholder management. The, I don't think that the situation is a surprise to anybody in, a, in any business, in any way, shape or form. Um, the, so, so really you just need to articulate it to suppliers um, to, to let them understand that we're dealing with a global pandemic and depending on what suppliers they're talking about they're going to be affected 
there there's no part of the world that or, or no service that is not affected um by the global pandemic and certain um categories will be affected more so food supply may have the unique challenges medical supplies may have the unique challenges um other industries which require pe people to physically go into the office or physically go into the factory or physically go into the plant to fulfill their duties will also be affected differently as well so um, clearly the supply chain is going to be impacted on multiple levels and uh, i'll be surprised if, if if any stakeholders don't understand that um, next question when is our next webinar session on procurement um, I'll advise everyone just to go to the SIPS website and look at the events page. So that's the www.sips.org and you can look at uh, the, the, the events page if you, if you want to look at that. Uh, we had a question, uh, who's this? Uh, Am Amanullah, did you have a question for us that you wanted to ask live? Okay, I'll come back to you in a second. I'll take some other questions. Um, right. Okay. In creative services, uh, the, the question here is around uh, creative services. So in creative services, some products that are used do not have suitable alternatives. In such a situation, the supplier is core to your business, but the value of your business is supplier um, oh, sorry, we, we've had that question already. I do apologize. That's around um, um, monopolistic scenarios. Um, procurement targets is to save cost and bias KPIs around how much they save. In order to get a lower cost of an item, procurement agrees with the vendor to go for higher MOQs and the MOQ equals the requirements of a year or more leading overstocking invites deterioration of quality and ultimately a loss for the organization. Is this ethical? So um, that's a long winded question, but all I'll say is I'll, I'll, I'll refer to the earlier part of my presentation, which says that really we're talking about um, obtaining goods and services for the lowest total cost of ownership. And that involves several elements. Um, and you know, if, if you're if you're undertaking in unethical sourcing or you're overstocking, um, that's going to be to the detriment of your organisation, and 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 as a consequence, you're really not of, of, of achieving the lowest total cost of ownership in any case. So I would then argue um, whether you're obtaining what your organisation wants you to wants you to achieve. So I think on, on that point, really, um, I think we had a lot of questions which are which are touching on um, most of the points we spoke about before. Um, I'll just go to this point and say, look, I thank you all very much for attending this session. Uh, great interaction. You, you can engage with us again, uh, www.cips.org, or you can link with me on LinkedIn, uh, sam.achampong, or sorry, just Sam Achampong on LinkedIn, but via email, sam.achampong at sips.org. Um, it's been a great session. Thanks for your questions. Keep in touch and look out for our next webinar. Thank you very much.